half in the bag. Calgon, take me away. Calgon is a space alien. Well, Jay, now that coronavirus is over, I guess we're stuck with a lot of products that have movie tie-ins for movies that will never be released. Like WW84, featuring a lady. What is this? Oh, Wonder Woman. Yeah, they printed up like a million bags. I guess why not use them? Oh my God, the movie comes out in movie theaters on June 5th. We've got to get our tickets. Oh wait, never mind. What's a movie theater? It's an now defunct place where a large group of infected people would all go to sit in a room together. Like you'd watch a movie with strangers? Like a bigger version of your living room? Yeah, and even though a lot of these movies are ready to be released, the studios are scared to put them on streaming services. They'd rather wait for the large disease rooms to open back up. Yeah, and much more expensive to go to as well. That's why they're waiting. But studios are going to have a big surprise waiting for them when these movie theaters never open up again. <laughs> so, Jay, what are all these movies that we're never going to see? Mulan, canceled due to coronavirus. Candyman. Canceled due to coronavirus. Wonder Woman 1984. Canceled due to coronavirus. A Quiet Place 2. Canceled due to John Krasinski. The French Dispatch, directed by Wes Anderson. Canceled due to coronavirus. Just watch one of his other movies. They're all the same. The Fast and Furious 9. Just watch a Wes Anderson film. They're all the same. Black Widow. Canceled due to coronavirus. Spiral. A new Saw movie starring Chris Rock? Venom 2, canceled due to who cares? Antebellum. I don't know what it is, but it's never coming out. Somebody made it, and it's never coming out. No Time to Die, canceled due to coronavirus. What an ironic title, because coronavirus. Well, how can any of those movies compete with some of the quality stuff on Netflix, like The Wrong Missy? <laughs> That was supposed to get a wide theatrical release, did you know that? It was canceled before coronavirus. The wrong Missy created coronavirus. I wish I could social distance from the wrong Missy. Mm -hmm. I wish it would stay six feet away from me or wear a mask. What the fuck is this? It's like a... Is, is it like a poster for a Terminator fan film? Oh, Terminator Dark Fate. Remember that? Why wasn't that canceled due to coronavirus? Well, it's funny, actually, the Dark Fate connection, because that's a very, uh, that was uh, marketed as a very female-driven action movie. And we're doing a, a, a female-driven episode. We're talking about two very different ways you can portray female characters in your movies. That's right. <laughs> While we eat our Wonder Woman Cool Ranch Doritos and regular Doritos, we're talking about two female movies. One we liked, I presume, and one we absolutely loved. Please tell me somebody got that on video! So, Jay, I've got some paper. I see that. I'm so old, I print out paper. There's a lot of information on these papers, and it's hard to read all that on your phone. Okay. So that's why I print off paper. Look at me. You know you can change the size of the text on your phone. Let's just zoom in and stuff. Um, so we'd have two films, The Assistant and The Wrong Missy. We watched it. Both are pro-feminist <laughs> films. <laughs> and I just noted some interesting things. The, the Wrong Missy, uh, a 37% critic score. That high? That high. And that's, that's shocking. That's what I'm gonna talk about. 52% uh, audience rating. Uh, and then The Assistant, 91% critics. 25% audience. Um, okay. And so, with the wrong Missy, I printed up quotes, which we could play over the trailer, uh, of positive reviews, and then the assistant, I printed up quotes of negative All right. reviews. And we're, our first film is The Assistant. Welcome. Have a seat. Whatever's going on, you can tell me. That's what I'm here for. Nothing happens in this movie I literally mean nothing. An assistant does her job and goes home. A movie that went nowhere from start to finish. Don't waste your money or time. 
You might as well just live stream a real assistant answering the phones for 90 minutes. It would be just as good of a movie. Very bad. Dry. No fucking lube. What the hell did I just watch? I expected a lot more based on the trailer. In the words of Trilly B, the biggest of the BTMBs, this movie is a gassy fart. I am a doctor working in a hospital ICU during the COVID pandemic. And having spent my one night off this week watching this, not only did I completely waste my time, but this was somehow the worst night of my week. <laughs> you could tell me that last one was from either movie and I wouldn't know which one you were talking about. Well, that was, that was the general consensus among people was that the assistant was boring. And I understand that. I liked the movie, uh, but I can see people, well, I don't know, that first one they say like literally nothing happens. It's like, you pay attention, this, things happen, it's very subtle, but uh, I can see a lot of people being bored by the movie even though I thought it was pretty good. Oh, I, I loved this movie. Um, and we, we talked about Willy Wonka recently. Uh, and Mel Stewart, the director of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the 1971 film, uh, was primarily a documentary filmmaker. I looked up the director of this. She did a couple of films, and they're all kind of feminist-centric documentaries. So it makes sense that this movie has sort of like a, a real-life documentary feel. And of course, based on the trailer, the trailer does kind of lead you in the direction that's going to be more of a thriller, mystery kind oh, of thing. Oh, really? I yeah. haven't even seen the trailer. The, the trailer does what a trailer needs to do, gets you to watch the movie. Can you deal with this? Hi. Why me? That's the problem with a movie like this though, when they try to make the trailer exciting, then you're gonna get people more angry than they maybe otherwise would be because they're misled. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a typical trailer where that's, it keeps cutting to like critics, mm. the, the most uh, intense on your edge of your seat movie since Fast and the Furious 9. <laughs> you don't really get the impression that it's a movie based on Harvey Weinstein you, or his ilk. Uh, Very influenced by Harvey Weinstein specifically because it's about a powerful producer. And, a film company. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you kind of get the impression that there's going to be some dramatic twists and turns and stuff, and, and it's very straightforward. There's and, not that by design. It's what works about the it's, movie. It's, it's what makes it work. Yeah. And I was just sort of like, it's sort of, I was in a trance watching it. Even though, you know, Nothing happens nothing according happens, to, to yeah. certain viewers. Nothing really does happen, but a lot happens. And, and it's done so, so intentionally, mm -hmm. uh, and it's done so tastefully in a way where it, it's, it's like the, one of the better horror movies I've seen. Okay. And there are so many little tricks and so many things they didn't show you. It's the, the, it's the uh, you know, the, the Jaws uh, effect. Yeah. Well, and also the uh, when people say like nothing happens, like it, it starts out, it's very almost documentary like where we see it's one day of her working in this office for a Weinstein like producer. Um, and it's all done very like just everyday mundane, which is why when the creepy Weinstein stuff starts to creep in, that's treated as sort of mundane everyday work. And that's why it's interesting, like when the Weinstein stuff started to break, people were like, how did nobody know? How about you know, nobody knew this was happening? When the, the dirty secret is that everybody knew? Maybe not like, you, now people post photos of like Weinstein with like Oprah and like Meryl Streep, like they probably didn't know. But the day-to-day -day office worker people, they do. And it just became a boring, mundane part of their job the same as like uh, making coffee or taking phone calls mm -hmm. and that's what makes the movie effective is that it's all presented as just something that's become so normal yeah uh, you mentioned the beginning uh, which takes the uber and so yeah 
documentary, you see her wake up, the actress, we'll talk about the actress in a minute. Um, it's dark. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's morning. You don't know if it's night. You see her get up, kind of go through her routine. She's leaving this kind of dumpy house, gets in a car and has to go all the way into the city. She's driving into the city. There's lots of shots of, you know, the, the New York City waking up. And then you start to realize, oh, okay, she's going into work. She's going into work super fucking early. Mm -hmm. No dialogue, all shots. Uh, it could have been, you know, like, uh, it could have been, like, oh, her alarm goes off. Oh, God. Oh, her mom calls her. Oh, you're still doing that job? Yes, it's, it's five in the morning, and I'm the one who has to go in and open up the office, Mom. You know, exposition. None of that. Nothing. We watch her go through her morning routine. She does all this stuff in intricate detail. All the little, she's printing out things, putting on people's desks. Nobody has shown up yet. And that's like 20 minutes. Yeah, and there's a, like a methodical nature to the rhythm of it, too. Like yeah. the editing and how long each shot goes on. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of like hypnotic. Yeah, similar to like a Gus Van Sant kind of thing. Oh, like a Psycho remake? Like the Psycho remake, like <laughs> Goodwill Hunting, you know, movies like that. Yeah, uh, Finding Forrester. Well, more, most of I'm talking about uh, Last, Last Days, uh, the Kurt Cobain film. The just elephant, like, yeah. Elephant. You're just like mesmerized by the repetition, the tension, you're waiting for something to happen, you're wondering where they're taking you. They're not spelling everything out for you. Um, but uh, the assistant follows, because I know everyone's going to try to fast forward past this to get, <laughs> to get to the wrong Missy review. But the assistant stars um, Julia Garner. Uh, you know her from We Are What We Are. We Are What We Are. Cannibal a, movie. A wonderful film directed by Jim Mickle, yeah. I know her from the wonderful show Ozark. Oh, As have you watched Ozark? I have watched Ozark, and I've watched all the seasons now, and I'm all caught up, so any of you fucking pricks on Twitter try to spoil anything. <laughs> Helen Pierce. <laughs> Whoops! Sorry, I, 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 I took it out on about a million people when only one person spoiled 90 Day Fiance for me, so <laughs> sorry about that, Ozark viewers. Hopefully Jay will bleep that spoiler out in editing. Um, I can't bleep it out from my brain, though, because now I heard it. But Ozark, I love it. Julia Garner plays Ruth, a foul-mouthed redneck who's helping Marty launder money. But in this, she, she doesn't say the F word once. I don't know shit about fuck. Uh, and she plays a young intern at a film company, an assistant. The, the, the New York wing of a film company. The New York wing, yeah. Which, which is important because it's not when people think, like, uh, Hollywood film production. You think of, like, all the movies about Hollywood films and like the big offices with the big windows overlooking LA. This is just a dumpy office building. It's the side of behind the scenes of the movie industry that you don't even see in the movies. Mm -hmm. You think of like uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure when he's riding through all the sets and you, know, <laughs> you think that's what it looks like, but really like, yeah, the New York production offices of a film company that's multinational Assuming it's a Miramax kind of Weinstein company sure, type thing. Sure, one of those types, yeah. Um, where, yeah, they do, they're always talking about going to LA and back and they have production offices, but really it's just people like looking at spreadsheets and it's disgustingly lit and it mm -hmm. looks gross. And it, it doesn't, that little room she works in with the two other guys, and it doesn't look like a movie office set. It looks like a real dirty office that, yeah. that isn't quite polished and perfect. And, and the way everybody talks to each other too is just yeah. so mundane. They're not spelling anything out. Yeah, it, it doesn't have those big scenes. You keep waiting for it to have that scene where she has a big speech or she goes off on someone and it never happens. The biggest scene in the film is when she goes to the HR rep and you know, Which again is very like you, you see her go down the stairs and walk to the building next door, yeah. then go up the stairs, and it's yeah, it's very uh, very methodical. Yeah. I guess we'll say spoilers uh, if you do, if you want to watch the assistant and enjoy it, um, we'll say spoilers. But we never see the boss, we never clearly hear him on the phone. It's always got this weird, like, distortion, or mm -hmm. it's it's very distant. Uh, all of his activities are very distant, and it's very obvious too to yeah. to our our lead. Or the um, moment when she has to go meet a girl on the elevator to give her her earring back. Yep. 
That's a, a, a great detail. No, no, nothing mentioned about it before or she after. She finds it and then she puts it in her drawer. She kind of knows why it's there. Mm -hmm. Never see the boss. He's, he's, he's untouchable. He's mysterious. Mm -hmm. She does her best to say something, but it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to lose your job over this. You can't stay quiet. And yeah, everybody else is sort of uh, willingly ignorant about it when she goes to HR. And, and I, I found an earring in the office and today. An earring? Forgive me, but are you often um, cleaning things off his floor? I mean, we have a janitorial crew, right? I understood what it would be like to be in that situation better from this super mundane, simple story than any sort of like news headline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it made you look at it from a different perspective, like like you just said. Yeah, news headlines, Harvey Weinstein. Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't I? Ever... Yeah. And then you watch a movie like this and you're like, oh, okay. The real version of it was creepy. Mm -hmm and you really couldn't do anything about it. And so, yeah, it was a great movie. I, re I really liked it, and I was, I was, even though, as people said, it was more exciting to watch paint dry, I disagree. Yeah. I, was, I was like hooked, like, from start to finish. And it's a short movie, it's like 90 minutes. Yeah. It's that, not that like it's three hours isn't, long. Yeah, that would be hard. I mean, even as it is, it could probably still kind of function as a short film. Maybe, um, yeah. But I, I think, for me, it, it's not going to work for everybody. And if no. someone says it's boring, I completely get it. Sure. Because um, you watch a movie, it, it's, it's on that line between being preachy and being entertainment. Yes, it does have a message, you know, an important, strong message about this. But at the same time, you want to entertain people because it's a movie. So it's almost, it's almost like watching a documentary. Um, and Without ever hitting you over the head or, or talking down to you at all. Yes, we never... It's just, here it is. She never walks in on the room when he's assaulting a woman. We never see anything. It's the perfect example of, of things that we don't see are scarier. Mm -hmm. And she knows something's going on, but she's not quite sure. You're very separated. There's a wall yeah. in between you and that drama. And everybody wanted that drama. They wanted her to <laughs> kick the door open and see... Harvey Weinstein, you know, assaulting some lady and her to call the cops and all this drama to happen and I'm going to fire you and the police, he sends an assassin with a laser scope to, sh to shoot at her through, you know, and she's driving in the taxi cab and <laughs> Weinstein's behind her in the car trying to run her off the road. Instead, she leaves the building and goes and eats a muffin. And if the Oscars happen, I think it'll get nominated for some kind of Oscar or something. Uh... It's probably a little too under the radar. I think, I think so. It's probably a little too small of a movie. It's got that. It's got that. Uh, that hot button message, though, Jay. That's true. That's true. So now, oh, well, we've added three movies now because before the only nominations were going to be Troll, Trolls World Tour, and uh, what else did we talk they, about? They rescinded the "It Has to Be Played in Theaters" thing, by the way. They did. Oh, okay. So well, that means that the wrong Missy can get a nomination. Well, speaking of the wrong Missy, <laughs> let's go to commercial. Do about what? All right, Jay, it's time to move on. Okay. Now these are positive reviews. These are reviews by award-winning film critics that gave the movie a positive tomato. All right, so these are critic reviews, not user reviews. These are critic reviews. Okay. I, of course, skip the user reviews. These are these are paid off critics. I mean, critics okay. that want to get invited to Adam Sandler premieres and, and parties on his yacht. I, I mean, just regular movie critics that gave the movie a positive score. Here's some excerpts while we show clips from the trailer. Ah. I was vaguely amused here and there. This is every bit an Adam Sandler movie. If you're going to watch this kind of movie, then you're going to watch this kind of movie. The Wrong Missy is like a comedic Raiders of the Lost Ark. Lauren Lapkiss is the boulder. <laughs> I don't know if that's good I, or bad. I don't know what the fuck that means. But these are good reviews. Yeah, those are good reviews. The narrative is predictable, but the situations are outlandish and wacky enough to keep you invested. Ultimately, The Wrong Missy is yet another film of wacky, somewhat likable characters 
all run through the sadistic ringer of comedy and a story that survives on a handful of over-the-top, cringeworthy moments. That's a positive review. Sandler has packaged far worse films for Netflix, and watching The Wrong Missy, it's easy to sit back and give in to the movie's it is what it isness. <laughs> That's what they said about Casablanca. <laughs> Yeah. I guess people are desperate for anything in these coronavirus times. Yeah. People need something light. They need to laugh. They need to lift their spirits. By watching 60-year-old David Spade in a terrible wig get vomited on by a horribly, horribly unfunny actress. I am Hellstar! Who dares to enter my lair? We'll just say it right now. This is an Adam Sandler vehicle, Happy Madison Happy Madison is his production company, where yeah. Where mysteriously, every film ends up on a cruise ship or in Hawaii. We're, we've talked about this before. This is obvious. He asked Netflix for money. He has a deal with Netflix to produce Happy Madison films. They don't even go in theaters anymore. No. They just go right on Netflix. He gets uh, $50 million to make one of these movies. One million of those dollars is spent on the cast and crew mm -hmm. and the budget and the production. And the other $49 million goes to David Spade and Rob Schneider. Mm -hmm. And everybody's happy. You know who else is in the movie? Playing his, because it's uh, David Spade is up for the big promotion and he's got his rival. That rival woman? Yeah, yeah. That's Adam Sandler's wife. Oh, I did not know that. They I think all... his daughter is in the movie, too. Have respect for the island. Shut the fuck up! And you're not joking! You like 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 don't even know that! That would make sense, yeah. They all got a nice trip to Hawaii. But... Also in the movie, can we talk briefly? Do you know who Nick Swarsden is? Uh, yeah. Nick Swarsden, another one of Adam Sandler's horribly unfunny friends. He plays the friend. The he plays the friend, friend in this. He had his own Happy Madison vehicle a few years ago called Bucky Larson, Born to be a Star. Ooh. One of the biggest flops of all time. And he is uncomfortable to watch in this movie because he looks, I'm not fat shaming, he doesn't look fat, he looks bloated, like coke bloat. And his voice is all raspy. So it's good news, bad news, more bad news. Your ex fiance is gonna be at the retreat. Cause it's not just that he's like overweight, it's like he looks horribly unhealthy. In a way, I remember Chris Farley hosted SNL like three months before he died. And I don't know if you ever saw it, it was so awkward. Mm -mm. He was so like off I'm... and he looked terrible. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I've really learned some lessons tonight. You know what I've learned? I've learned lessons about responsibi responsibility. And it was like three, and three months later, or maybe six months later, he died. The, the Artie um, Lang syndrome? Yes, yeah. yeah. But he's in the movie because he's their friend. And he's supposed to be, he's playing the typical role in these movies where you have your main guy and the friend that the main guy explains everything that's happening in the movie to. And he says, dude, what? Yeah. He's that role. Guys who should be 25. Yes. Yeah. Not, not bloated uh, cokeheads. Not bloated in their six, 40s. 60 year old. <laughs> no, in their 50s. Yeah, maybe in their 50s. Or, or, or even 60s. <laughs> I, I do, yeah, it's like, yeah, the, that I'm working my way up the corporate ladder. I got to impress the boss. Mm -hmm. Like David Spade is, is like 58 years old <laughs> and he should be well past the I got to impress the boss phase. I mean, clearly they pulled the script out of a dumpster. Maybe like the intern wrote it or, you know, they always talk about like, like when, when a production company gets scripts and like an intern has to read them. Oh yeah. And like 90% go in the no pile and you know, some go in the maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is all the no pile. Yeah. And it's like the top one was the wrong Missy, some high concept like trash comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, how many locations? Yeah. Uh, how many? Uh, can we shoot it in Hawaii? Can we shoot it in Hawaii? Can my wife be in it? Yeah. We'll give the lead to my buddy David Spade. No one's right for any of this. There's nothing you could ever do would disappoint me. I love you. This whole time I thought I was texting my dream girl. <laughs> I was texting that crazy girl. To the best weekend ever. Uh, okay, well the premise of the movie, he uh, meets two women in a short span of time, both named Missy, he has a horrible blind date. Let's have two tequilas, please, senorita. First chink in the armor, Mr. Perfect's not so perfect. Oh, am I? Do you want to get uh, it uh, now? Uh, 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 but she's the most obnoxious person ever, which would be fine as like a singular scene where she's just this weird, uh, creepy, obnoxious person. She pulls out a knife. She just says bizarre things. Yeah. Um, and then he meets another woman with the same name. And then he accidentally invites the wrong Missy to uh, a Hawaii uh, 
uh, corporate retreat. Thing. The, the other thing to mention is the other woman is 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 better for him. She's she's like perfect for him. Yeah. She's you know, and she also looks age appropriate for age him. Age appropriate. <laughs> Um, she's reasonable, normal. They have a nice conversation. He, they set up that David Spade doesn't drink alcohol. Neither does she. They're both reading the same book. Yada, yada. What you'd think would be your soulmate. Yeah. And then there's a switcheroo where he accidentally invites the wrong Missy to the corporate retreat in Hawaii. Yes. And there is your premise. And the predictable script thing to do is, oh, as he gets to know the wrong Missy, he learns a little bit more about her and he actually starts to fall for her. That this is does. all this is all given away in the trailer. Yeah. But the character is portrayed so obnoxious and so horrible that it, it's beyond absurd to think that he could ever actually fall for her. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Oh, I like the feel of that. I like the smell of that. <gasps> oh shit, no shit, oh shit. What? The only way to make that work is if you treated that absurd, the idea of him actually falling for her. But they, they force in that shitty Happy Madison, like fake sentimentality stuff halfway through the movie. She's already sexually assaulted him twice. Yeah, David Spade gets raped. He gets raped on a plane. He gets raped in their hotel room. There's probably a way to do that funny, but everything is just executed so awkwardly. That, that, I think that's the big standout in this movie. The big question mark is that we don't know. Um, because you watch it and you're like, okay, it's got, it's got a pretty typical comedy premise. Got it. But if, if she played it much more toned down and was just a little eccentric and did really like embarrassing things. Like it was really like stuffy kind of corporate retreat and she was kind of a free spirit and just did some kind of- Or stuff. socially awkward. Socially something. awkward, yeah, and, but didn't take it. She, she plays it like she's just batshit insane. Like an insane person, yeah. And, and it becomes uh, just obnoxious and it's and, hard to watch like it's one of those where you get like secondhand embarrassment for the actors kind of thing yeah and 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 i don't know if it's a situation this is the question mark <laughs> put a big old question mark on the screen i don't know if it's a situation where they just said uh lauren lipkis just go crazy the director i looked up is like some kid who looks like he's 18 years old it's not one of the usual uh adam sandler movie directors no it's like some guy who's like 20 and who's directed like comedy shorts for like the internet oh. and, and somehow he's helming this movie <laughs> probably paid him 50 bucks <laughs> you get to go to hawaii hundred dollars you get to hang out with nick swarsden <coughs> going on See you, babe! Yeah! The movie is a comedy vehicle for this Missy character, and the, the, the humor is not funny. I made it! I made it! Yeah! The portrayal in the first half is so obnoxious that there's absolutely no way you can get on her side in the second half when they're supposed to really fall it's, in love. It's very difficult, and there's a, there's a shift in her behavior to where she becomes a little less obnoxious. And that's when he starts kind of falling for her. And it's like- But it's not motivated by anything. Yeah. Isn't like the shift is, uh, cause his boss, they got, the movie got one joke, one laugh from me. I didn't want a coffee. Oh, should I drink it? I don't care. Yeah. Something about it made me laugh. The boss has an assistant guy who comes up with the coffee. Yeah. And then it happens again. And then you expect the third time is we, we desperately need coffee, <laughs> you know. Uh, no, it never comes back. At this boss. this hilarious comedy situation that we've set up <laughs> randomly really needs a cup of hot coffee. And then cut to him, you know, yeah. smoking a joint out on the beach. Yeah, something. Uh, I would like, well, oh, well, I do two comedies and threes. Where's the third? Where is the cop? What is the point of the coffee setup? They had to cut that scene so they could have more hilarious hijinks with Lauren Lapkus yelling. Scared you're gonna lose the only supportive adult relationship you've ever had. All right, stop using that voice. Stop being a bad husband, floppy bags. But uh, the, the, what I was gonna say is that the boss, she like hypnotizes him. She's a hypnotist too, in addition to, cause she's weird and does all these things. So that's like David Spade starts to turn around to liking her when 
she hypnotizes his boss into liking him. So it's not anything like selfless or, or good that she's done. Well, she, then, then there's that scene where she tries to have uh, an awkward threesome with his ex fiance Oh, yeah. But yeah, that and then they're like having a threesome. They keep kicking her in the face. The joke is that she just gets kicked in the face a lot, I guess. They don't have a punchline. Just to have her leave. Yeah, so he chooses to have sex with Missy and he keeps kicking her off the bed. But he does it accidentally. It's an accident thing. It'd be one yeah. thing if he like forced her out in a comical way, but it would be. It's, yeah. it's accidental, but it's also st supposed to be uh, on purpose. I don't know. Yeah, there's probably forty-seven other ways you could you could do the scene where he gets rid of the ex in a funny way. Yeah. But then, so she just keeps accidentally getting kicked in the face, and then just decides to leave. Mm -hmm. I guess it's funny that she was trying to participate in the three-way, but kept getting knocked off the bed. Let's talk about Rob Schneider's performance. Oh my God, Rob Schneider shows up in this film. That's what I'm talking about. Let's get this wussy wet. <laughs> I think they realize that he can't play ethnic characters anymore because in all the earlier Adam Sandler movies, he's like Chinese, he's like Middle Eastern. They can't do that anymore. So now he's just man. You know what I, I really despised in the whole movie? Like this really shows the laziness is their corporate retreat. Yeah. They put up uh, the name of the company is Credit of America, something like that. It's just like the worst fake company name <laughs> and they put up a banner and it's just like this generic font and it just says credit of America, like bank of America. It's just times new Roman on yeah, white. Yeah. And it's just, it, it, it's, ah, oh. like they couldn't even come up with like a cool, like original company name, like, or like software company. Or, yeah. I mean, they have to be some kind of corporate -y yeah. financial consultants or something. It's just, Credit of America, it's like whatever, whatever. The bare minimum to try and trick Netflix into thinking they're making a real movie. Yeah, basically. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Missy is not who I thought she was. She's free. Uh, at, the, at this stage of the game, I'm at acceptance to where I realize that there is an audience for this. We've talked about our buffet analogy. Oh yeah. Where Netflix can, everyone, everyone wins. I guess the only real losers here is a very slim percentage of the audience that will turn on the wrong Missy without watching the trailer, without, without knowing anything about it mm -hmm. and just watch it. Then they're truly wasting their time. Because if you watch the trailer. You know everything you need to know. You know everything you need to know. You say, "Oh, this looks terrible." Even a trailer can't make this movie look good. Yeah. So you watch. The, if you watch, if you're dumb enough to watch the movie after watching the trailer, that's on you. <laughs> and there's 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 a whole bunch of people who will watch this because it's a turn off your brain. You know, it's, there, there's a lot of those comments. Escapism. It's just, uh, there's a couple of funny parts, but uh, there, the Hawaii looks nice. <laughs> uh, you know, I I don't, I, I don't have have to hear the term social distancing. There's a part on the airplane when they're oh, on yeah. the airplane. And we got a cameo by Hurley from Lost. Can you do me a huge favor and maybe uh, check my breath for me? What's that, bud? I don't know if that was a joke. The fact that it's like the lost guy on a plane flying oh, to the tropics. Oh, I, I didn't even that, think about that. That was my so. first reaction, and I was like, There's oh. no reason for him to be there, and he's not like a big name celebrity where you're yeah. like, hey, it's whoever. I thought it was a joke like, it, like you take that a step further, David Spade sits down on the plane and oh, yeah, uh, and looks around and oh, you know, that's another actor from Lost. That's another actor oh, from Lost. Yeah, yeah. And you see all the characters from Lost on this plane, yeah. which was uh, is obviously doomed. I thought that was the joke, but he was just a guy. Yeah. And so I was like, that's a pretty funny joke is that they got the guy from Lost on a plane flying to a tropical island. But that wasn't the joke. The joke was... I thought he was going to be a recurring character, but no. No. The joke was, does my breath smell bad? I'm, I'm meeting a lady. It smells good. Did you eat dog shit this morning? 
I'm just kidding, you're good to go. Just kidding, man, your breath smells fine. Okay, oh, that was the joke. That was the joke. Yeah. Well, and then the wrong Missy shows up, and, and while David Spade is sleeping, she starts giving him a hand job. And I was waiting, uh, you know, we see Hurley across the aisle watching this happen. He should have looked at the camera and said, This is worse than my last flight. <laughs> Everybody got paid. <laughs> See, I think I think of movies like this. H have you ever seen improv comedy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate improv. Okay. Not not a uh, like in a movie when characters ad lib that can work. But you're talking about when you go to an improv show and they say to the audience, "Give me a name, give me a city, and give me an object," and then they make a skit out of it. Yeah. There, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but there's a certain breed of human beings. Uh, there's regular people, and then there's people who laugh at improv. And because um, I could go to improv and I, I will never laugh. Yeah. I, I guess they are putting their comedy in a context, sort of. Comedy needs a context, and comedy needs to be thought out. Yeah, you're, you're more of a structure guy, so that yeah. makes sense. And yeah. people acting silly or saying random things or making stuff up on the spot, never funny to me. And I could sit at an improv show and not laugh yeah. one bit, and there are people that just laugh at anything. Tell me underwater, we're mermaids. But you won't be able to understand me. Of course I will. We're mermaids. And, the, and that is the, the target audience for these kind of movies, is, is people that laugh at improv. Because um, improv is the worst thing since cancer, <laughs> or, or bagpipes, <laughs> or coronavirus. So people will watch this as escapist humor. It's, it's, it's glowing on their television, it's colorful. Uh, someone's yelling crazy things about poop, or if my hand smells like your butt crack, or... Lauren Lapkiss falls off a cliff at one point. Oh, shit! Oh my god! Oh my god! I, I can't really think of any redeeming qualities. I mean, you see, you, you see the resort that they're staying at the whole time. Oh, sure. The film crew and Adam Sandler's staying at and everybody's staying at. Well, Adam Sandler isn't there. He was probably off filming Uncut Gems when this was made. Maybe, maybe. Which I guess we should mention that briefly if we're going to shit on Adam Sandler some more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uncut Gems is not an Adam Sandler movie. No. Okay. Uncut Gems, very briefly, you haven't seen it, right? No. It's a very good movie. I have nothing to say about it that hasn't been said a million times already. Uh, but... Every seven or eight years, Adam Sandler does a real movie. And everybody says, oh, Adam Sandler, he's great in this movie. Adam Sandler is very good in a very specific type of role. He's very limited as an actor, but when he's used appropriately, he's very good. Punch Drunk Love is one of my favorite movies. Um, so Uncut Gems is the newest example of that. And, but everybody always says after these movies, oh, this is a turn for Adam Sandler. He's going to start doing more. And then he does shit like this. I know he's not in it. He, his company produced it. He's less involved whatever, but he followed up Punch Drunk Love with anger management. Every time he does something really good, he follows it up with garbage. What? Ah! Well, Uncut Gems is not a cash cow. No, it's a movie that filmmakers wanted to make, the Safdie brothers, they're very talented filmmakers. Um, and, and they knew that Adam Sandler, his personality would be appropriate for that character. And it is, and so he's really good at it. They sought him out. Yeah. I was trying to think if The Wrong Missy was worse or better than Jack and Jill. I think it was better than Jack and Jill. It is. I mean, that's not saying much. Jack and Jill, though, like, I think when we talked about that, that didn't even feel like a movie. No. This feels like someone had a script. It's a very generic script, but it's a script. It's got somewhat of a structure to it. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily to the, the jokes. There's not really any well-crafted jokes. But no. it... story-wise, it's serviceable. And it didn't feel too sleazy in terms of like product placement. I remember Jack and Jill was more like there's like Pepsi and Pepto-Bismol. Pep yeah. Uh, uh, Royal Dunkin' Caribbean. Donuts, Royal Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. Yeah. Camera, like, I think, well, I think that's the only way they could get those movies made because those are like theatrical productions. Yeah. Now they're doing the Netflix things. They're cheaper to make. They don't have to do yeah. as much shoehorned in product placement. Yeah. I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. 
Yeah. But it's still not anything that anyone should ever watch. No. Yeah, there is like a lower stakes element to it, as opposed to like Jack and Jill. Like we saw that in the theater. I know. And this has that like, ah, oh, it's just another dumb thing on Netflix. So it's like. Yeah. The stakes are lower. You're not ruining a franchise. You're not remaking your classic comedy. Yeah. And, you know, oh, plus I remember, I just remember this. Jack and Jill was, the budget for it was like $70 million. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can guarantee this movie didn't cost that much. Right. Maybe I'll take a shit too. Mm, don't have to. Nah, you never know. I'll push. Well, Jay, would you recommend? No. <laughs> Mike, would you recommend? No. no. If you've watched everything else on Netflix, like literally everything else, and you just need something to pass 90 minutes, still don't watch it. Well, Jay, we're back in business. Business is booming. I had a client call earlier today, and he said he did watch everything on Netflix. Oh. So he went downstairs and he found his great, 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 great grandfather's VHS tapes. Oh. And he found all these movies from the late 90s that he hasn't seen. So he dusted off this box that his great, 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 grandpa called a VCR and he wanted us to fix it. Now this young man was born in 2017 and he says before he goes off to college, he wants to watch these movies from 2008. These classics, these vintage classics on VHS and he wanted us to fix his VCR. And I've gotten maybe 30 phone calls like this. Oh. The catalogs of Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu, Apple Plus, all the streaming services, they've watched it all. All these young kids today, they've watched all of the programs and they wanna watch something called Jeremy Maguire on a VHS cassette and they want us to fix their VCRs. And you know what I told him, Jay? Right in the very end of that call, I said, let me get out my appointment book, let me get out my pen. And I told him that we couldn't do it. Oh, God. I finally made it home from Mexico. Oh, my God! It's just how I left it. Oh, oh, I'm so relieved. I was sure those two knuckleheads were going to trash the place. Oh, 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 oh. Oh no, I left my wallet in Tijuana. Uh, 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 sir, get off my shoe, sir. That's my shoe. Uh, uh, oh! <laughs>